Yeah, so this is our last class. A um, little bit sad, but it's been really nice. And hopefully it will be the final class for all of you that you will continue to uh, learn the Dharma, study the Dharma, practice the Dharma. And Tupta Norba Ling is offering a huge number. <laughs> kind of amazed at how many different courses they're offering <laughs> all day long. <laughs> um, yeah, and then there's also many other uh, centers that are offering teachings and His Holiness the Dalai Lama, fortunately, is um, giving teachings quite regularly. So yeah, there's many opportunities to learn the Dharma and it's good to keep learning and even go over the same material again and again. Like when the Dalai Lama teaches, um, well, now he's teaching online, but in the past, when he was teaching live and there'd be thousands of people, tens of thousands, even a hundred thousand people coming to his teachings. And, you know, some of those people are monks and nuns who've been studying for decades and they're thoroughly knowledgeable about all the different aspects of the path, but they still come and listen to the teachings. So there's always more that we can learn and also just refreshing what we have already learned so that we don't forget it. Anyway, let's start with recitation of prayers and a little bit of uh, contemplation to generate a positive motivation. <clears throat> So good to imagine the Buddha in front, <clears throat> made of light, radiant, blissful, looking at us and at all living beings with compassion and loving kindness, ready to help us. And if you can imagine all other living beings around you, taking refuge along with you, realizing that <clears throat> we have the potential to transform ourselves, to transform our minds, free them from all that is negative and problematic and develop all the positive qualities so we can have more and more peace and happiness <coughs> up to the, <clears throat> the state of um, awakening the state the Buddha achieved. And the Buddha is showing us how to do that. So we want to turn to him, rely on his guidance. <clears throat> <clears throat> I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By my practice of giving and other perfections, May I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly by my practice of giving and other perfections. May I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By my practice of giving and other perfections, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. <clears throat> may all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings be inseparable from the happiness that is free from suffering. May all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free from attachment for friends and hatred for enemies.
Reverently, I prostrate with my body, speech, and mind. I present clouds of every type of offering, actual and imagined. I declare all my negative actions accumulated since beginningless time and rejoice in the merit of all holy and ordinary beings. Please remain until the end of cyclic existence and turn the wheel of Dharma for living beings. I dedicate my own merits and those of all others to the great enlightenment. <clears throat> this ground anointed with perfume, strewn with flowers, adorned with Mount Meru, four continents, the sun and the moon. I imagine this as a Buddha field and offer it. May all living beings enjoy this pure land. Idam Guru Ratna Mandala Kamni Atayami. While reciting the mantra of the Buddha, imagine light, rays of light streaming out from the Buddha's heart and body in all directions, reaching all sentient beings, filling us and purifying all the defilements of our mind, ignorance, attachment, aversion, and so forth, all our karma, all the things that cause us suffering, both now and in the future, all this gets purified. And our positive potential is nourished so that it can grow and develop more and more. We can have more and more love and compassion and wisdom and other positive qualities culminating in the highest state enlightenment. Taya ta om mani maha manaye soha. Taya ta om mani mani maha manaye soha. Taya ta So have as your motivation for attending this talk, the wish to benefit others, to bring them more peace, happiness, free them from suffering and its causes. And if you're comfortable with the aspiration to become enlightened, a fully enlightened Buddha, to be able to help all beings in the best possible way. You can bring that into your mind as your reason, your motivation for being here. Okay, so today, or we have been on the great scope section of the Lamrim. And we've been covering the six perfections. <clears throat> we have the last two perfections. So I'm just going to do a quick uh, kind of 
introduction to the last two perfections. We don't have time to go into them in depth, but um, at least to give you some idea. And then from there, you can uh, study more, learn more about them. So the fifth perfection is called the perfection of concentration. Uh, some translators call it meditative stability. And that's actually a more accurate translation of the Tibetan term, which is samten. And um, so in the long rim, the way this is taught is by way of explaining how to develop calm abiding, also translated as serenity. Uh, so calm abiding is a special kind of concentration. It's, uh, it's actually a, an attainment, a realization that comes after working, training for quite a while. And so when you have calm abiding, you're able to keep your mind focused on your meditation object or whatever you choose to focus on. You can stay focused on that object for at least four hours, but also longer without any distraction, without your mind distracted to anything else and without um, dullness, heaviness, uh, we'll, we'll go into that a little bit later, what that means. Um, so it's like a very clear, sharp state of mind, awake and alert. And, um, and there's also bliss, both body and mind feel bliss. And another quality called pliancy, which is a sort of flexibility of body and mind. So it's a special kind of concentration. And it's uh, very important. It's something we do have to develop if we want to progress to enlightenment or even to nirvana, liberation. We do have to develop that. And so the Lamrim contains instructions on how to develop calm abiding. And there's quite a few details. I won't go into all the details, but just kind of give a rough overview of them. Um, so one of the points is about the conditions, conducive conditions. So this means, I mean, ideally to develop calm abiding, you go into retreat. Um, it, it would be very difficult to do if you're living in your ordinary circumstances, uh, going to work and having, you know, social activities and having people around and so on very difficult. I mean, you could develop a certain amount of concentration, but to go all the way to the end and attain calm abiding, I think it would be almost impossible. So if you do want to develop calm abiding, you go into a retreat and the teachings explain what are the ideal conditions. Uh, the place should be quiet, as quiet as possible, not a lot of noise. And also your lifestyle should be such that you um, are avoiding things that would distract your mind. So uh, no internet, no email, no reading news, newspapers, uh, watching TV, of course, entertainment, things like that. Uh, and even talking to people. Um, ideally you have one or a few people around who are living a similar lifestyle, a quiet contemplative lifestyle, and maybe helping you get your groceries and so on. Um, so you can talk to them, but not getting into, you know, conversations about politics and about, you know, gossip and yeah, things like that. So just really trying to limit your activities and then um, do many sessions a day of, of practice and also some of the conditions are inner conditions. We need to have few desires um, and be content with what we have because that can become a big distraction. For example, if you're, oh, my screen got all fuzzy. Um, 
You know, if you're constantly dissatisfied with things, oh, maybe I shouldn't be here. Maybe I should be somewhere else. Or, you know, I don't like my my meditation cushion. I should get a different one. I don't like the clothing I'm wearing. I should get a better one. So if you're constantly <laughs> feeling dissatisfied with the things you have, wanting more, wanting better, then that becomes... Um, a distraction that will interrupt your concentration. So we need to really work on uh, overcoming attachments and developing contentment. And also you need to live ethically. You need to uh, have really good ethical conduct. Um, if you're a lay person, keeping the five precepts. If you're a monastic, keeping whatever precepts or vows you have taken. So those are just some of the most important conditions. And, um, and then the second point is your meditation object. So the texts explain a number of different objects recommended. Um, there's something like 40 different objects you could choose from. <laughs> um, the breath is one of the objects you could use, and it's a fairly simple one because we're already breathing all the time. So we just focus on our breathing. And Lama Tsongkhapa, in his great stages of the path, the Lama Chenmo says, uh, the breath is a good object for those who have a lot of discursiveness. Like if your mind is very busy, a um, lot of thoughts, then the breath is, is helpful. But the Lamas usually recommend the image of the Buddha, visualizing the image of the Buddha. So <clears throat> you, you look at, statues and pictures of the Buddha in order to get familiar with what the Buddha looks like, the details. And then you close your eyes and you create that picture in your mind, mental image of the Buddha, and you use that as your object. That can be difficult for especially people who have difficulty visualizing, but they say it's a really good object to use because you're going to, you know, if you use the image of the Buddha, you're, you're going to be spending a lot of time focusing your mind on the image of the Buddha. And that has a very good effect on your mind. Uh, it's, very, it's a very virtuous object. And um, so also at the time of death, it'll be easy to think of the Buddha. You've spent so much time visualizing the Buddha, then it'll be very easy to think of the Buddha and take refuge in the Buddha at the time of death. And that will, that will be very helpful as you die and go to the next life. So there's a number of advantages to using the image of the Buddha. And the book, The Easy Path, explains a few different options of how to do that. Um, so then obstacles that occur along the way, this is quite important. Um, these are things that will hinder our practice and our attainment of calm abiding. The first obstacle is laziness. And in the context of calm abiding, laziness means you just don't feel like meditating. So it's a lack of energy, a lack of joyful enthusiasm to practice. <laughs> we usually have a lot of enthusiasm in the beginning when we first start meditating. But after a while, you know, we might find it boring and you know, we can find more interesting things to do with our time. So that's the meaning of laziness. And um, there's a number of antidotes to that. Uh, one is faith. Faith in this context means faith in calm abiding. Uh, so you need to learn about calm abiding and what the benefits are. What will be the benefits of having calm abiding? So when you study that, you'll get enthusiastic. Oh, yeah, I want to have that state of mind because that will bring a lot of benefits. That's the meaning of faith in this context. So when you have that faith, that will lead to aspiration. Aspiration is the wish to attain calm abiding. And that will lead to joyous effort, enthusiasm to keep practicing no matter how long it takes and how hard it is, you'll keep going. And then finally, um, pliancy. So if you do practice calm abiding, eventually you'll attain this uh, quality called pliancy. It's actually a mental factor. And 
as I said before, it's sometimes translated as flexibility or serviceability. So you're, you, they say your body feels very light and as if you could just do anything you want with your body. And your mind is also very flexible. You can do whatever you want with your mind. And so it's the opposite of sort of heaviness and lethargy and um, finding it difficult to do things that are virtuous. So they say pliancy is the real antidote to laziness. But to get pliancy, we need joyous effort in our practice. And to have that, we have to have the aspiration to attain calm abiding. And that comes from faith in the good qualities of calm abiding. And the second obstacle is forgetting the object. So what we do is, you know, we have sessions during the day. Um, they say it's good to start with short sessions, even just five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and then we can gradually increase the length of the sessions. But you sit down in a good position for meditation and generate a positive motivation. Then you go into the practice of um, focusing your mind on the object, whatever object you use. And you should choose one object and stick with that same object and not be changing your object all the time. And um, so we focus our mind on the object, but then sooner or later, after a few seconds or after a few minutes, our mind gets distracted. We forget our object and our mind is thinking about something else. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> so the antidote to that is mindfulness. Mindfulness is a mental factor and it, it means memory or remembering. And so in the, in the context of calm abiding, mindfulness is remembering your object. Oh, I'm supposed to be meditating on the breath. So you put aside that other thought and come back to the breath. So that's the meaning of mindfulness, remembering your object, not forgetting it, not losing it. So we do have mindfulness to a certain extent, but we need to build it up. We need to like build up our mindfulness muscle so that it's stronger and stronger and we can stay on our object longer and longer periods of time. And then number three, there's actually two obstacles here, sinking and excitement. Sinking is a kind of lack of uh, alertness and clarity, vividness in the way you see the object, that the mind just kind of loses its energy a little bit. And excitement is when the mind gets distracted from our object to an object of attachment. So we think about these old memories, all these fun times we've had, these good experiences we've had, or we fantasize about the future, all these fun things we're going to do in the future, and so on and so forth. So that's excitement. So I think initially, when we're first starting to do the practice, that's the biggest problem, is just our mind getting distracted away from our object to other things, usually things we're attached to. Sinking is probably there in the beginning as well, but it's not so obvious, it's more subtle. And so it mainly becomes a problem later after our mind gets a bit more uh, concentration than it's possible for the mind to just kind of sink a little bit. Sometimes it's called laxity. It's a little hard to understand. I think you have to practice um, and in order to recognize it. But anyway, the antidote to both of these is introspection or vigilance. So this is like a guard or a sentry. Sometimes they, yeah, guard or sentry. So it's kind of one factor of the mind, it's the mental factor, that is watching our mind, watching to see what's going on. Like a mother, you know, her, her kids are supposed to do their homework. And so she's kind of around, just keeping an eye on them, making sure they're doing their homework and not, you know, playing computer games or sending text messages or whatever, <laughs> so it's like that. So introspection is that part of the mind, just kind of keeping an eye what is the mind doing? Is it doing what it's supposed to do? Or is it off somewhere else doing something else? 
So introspection is, is what we'll notice, what we'll recognize if our mind has fallen into one of those obstacles, and then we need to apply antidotes. So there's different antidotes. Um, for excitement, if your mind is kind of really agitated and restless and just keeps running away, um, the antidote to that would be to keep bringing your mind back to the object, but it, you might need something stronger stronger medicine. So you can contemplate things like impermanence and death or the suffering of samsara to, to kind of sober the mind, to bring it down a bit so it's not so excited. But for sinking, um, you need to use something, you need to use an antidote that will uplift the mind. The mind is a little bit sunk, <laughs> so you need to bring it up. And so uh, Antidotes to that would be to think about the qualities of the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, uh, to think about your precious human life, to think, or, or to visualize light, just imagine light, something that kind of, yeah, brings up your energy and makes you feel more joyful, but not too joyful. <laughs> then, it, then you'll have excitement. <laughs> so often the mind is kind of, you know, going back and forth between these two, these two faults. So that's why we need good, strong introspection to recognize what's going on and then apply the antidotes. And then um, the fourth obstacle is neglecting to apply, apply antidotes. So that means if you do have one of those two problems, sinking or excitement, and you don't apply antidotes, that would be like, you know, the kids are supposed to be doing their homework and the mom is, she's on the phone <laughs> talking. And so, um, and so she's not paying attention and, you know, uh, disciplining the kids, make, you know, making sure they do their homework. So then they, they get into mischief and so on. So <laughs> like that, if, if uh, we don't apply the antidotes to these faults, then they just continue. And that becomes an obstacle to our development of calm abiding. So we do need to be very conscientious about noticing faults and applying the antidotes. And then number five is over applying antidotes. So that's a problem later on when you're when you're you know further on in your development of calm abiding and you you do have quite good concentration and you don't have so many obstacles coming up your mind is able to stay on the object but if you're overly attentive and using antidotes when you don't really need to that's a bit like like the mother with her kids the kids are sitting at their desks and they're doing their homework they're doing what they're supposed to be doing but she's coming in and you know looking over their shoulder and scolding them but you know that isn't right because they're doing what they're supposed to be doing <laughs> okay so that's that's not wise that's not skillful so that's not something we need to worry about in the beginning but it does become a problem later on so then the actual development of calm abiding proceeds through nine stages. I'm not going to go into all of these. Um, but the first stage is called setting the mind or placing the mind. And that's right in the beginning, you know, when we're first um, trying to develop calm, calm abiding and we decide, okay, I'm going to sit down and meditate on the breath or on an image of the Buddha. And I'm going to keep you know, keep my mind on that object as long as possible. And so at that point, at that stage, your mind isn't able to stay on the object very long, maybe only a few seconds, <laughs> literally. <laughs> it's going off. And so during your session of meditation, your mind will be uh, off the object more than on the object. It's constantly running away. But at least you're trying. And so we do need to appreciate the fact that we are at least trying to keep our mind on our object. And I mean, that itself is a really good thing to do, especially if we have a good motivation 
I want to attain calm abiding so that I can become a Buddha to help all living beings. So we should pat ourselves on the back and rejoice in our effort. So even if our mind keeps running away, then at least feel, well, it's still worth trying. <laughs> and then the second um, stage is called continuous setting. Okay, so after a while, um, you get to where your mind can stay on the object a little longer, like one minute. That's the one uh, in the teachings. That's one explanation of how you know if you've reached the second stage. When you can keep your mind on, your, on the object for a minute. I mean, they say for the, the amount of time it takes to recite one mala of Om Mani Padme Hum. But that's about a minute if you're going fast. Um, yeah, so your mind is still wandering away, you know, again and again and again. But there are periods of time when you can stay on it for about a minute. So that's the, the second stage. So I'm not going to go through all the other stages. You can read about them in the book. Um, but the idea is, as you go on, your mind will be able to stay on your object for longer and longer periods of time. And eventually, it doesn't get distracted at all. You have overcome the faults of sinking and excitement and you even get to the point where as soon as you sit down and start your session, your mind is on your object and it's able to stay on your object continuously the whole session. Yeah. So um, the, nine, the ninth stage is not yet calm abiding. That's the last stage before calm abiding. But when you do attain calm abiding, it's after the ninth stage. And I'll just read what cancer, hear me, cancer loss and jump, it says. Just a little brief explanation of calm abiding. Calm abiding is defined as a state of single pointed concentration characterized by exceptional mental and physical bliss and pliancy attained as a result of single pointedly focusing on one's object of meditation. It's important to say exceptional here because lesser levels of bliss and pliancy are experienced on the seventh through the ninth levels of mental abiding and minor levels of bliss and pliancy are experienced from the third level on. Exceptional bliss and pliancy only come with calm abiding. <clears throat> so we might start experiencing some bliss and pliancy early on in the practice, but we shouldn't get excited and think, oh, now I have calm abiding, now I have calm abiding. So we need to know very clearly what is the criteria for calm abiding. And it's probably good to have a teacher as well that we can check with who's going to confirm our experiences or not. So realistically, it's not easy. Um, when we hear about calm abiding, read about calm abiding, we might get really excited and want to attain it. And there's some, like the, in some of the traditional teachings, they say, oh, you can attain calm abiding in three months if you have all the right conditions. However, <laughs> I know people who have tried, you know, attaining calm abiding and sometimes even spent one year or two years or more in retreat working on calm abiding, but they still were not able to go all the way. Now, that's not to say it was a waste of time because they, I mean, they probably did develop very good concentration, but they just didn't get all the way to the, the goal of calm abiding. So just to let you know, it's not easy. And I mean, you might be one of the special people who maybe practiced it in past lives, and so you can attain it quickly and easily. But it's better not to have that expectation because otherwise you might be disappointed. Um, but it's worth doing. I, I did a six month retreat on calm abiding and it was tough, but I also learned a lot and I don't, have, I don't regret that I did it 
and I would like to do it again. I'd like to try again. It's a really wonderful practice to do. We learn a lot about our mind and we probably make mistakes, which we can all learn from. <laughs> and then if we don't have the chance to be in retreat, you can still practice calm abiding in your daily life. You can do sessions on a daily basis and you probably get some degree of concentration. Um, but to go all the way to calm abiding, ideally you do need to be in retreat. And so there's a number of books on calm abiding. Um, Alan Wallace has written a number of books. There's also a wonderful one by Gen Long Rimpa, published by Snow Lion. I forget what it's called because it changes. I think one at one point it was called Shamatha or calm abiding. I can't remember what the latest title was, <laughs> but anyway, it's Gen Long Rimpa published by Snowline. That's a really nice book. Very clear and kind of helpful for Westerners. Okay, now move on to the sixth perfection, the perfection of wisdom. So this is a really important one. And in the context of the Lam Rim, um, this is taught by way of developing special insight or vipassana into emptiness. So special insight um, is similar to calm abiding in that you experience physical and mental bliss and pliancy. But the difference is in the case of special insight, the bliss and pliancy arise as a result of doing analysis, doing analytical meditation on an object. It doesn't have to be emptiness. It could be some other object, um, but you're doing an analytical meditation, thinking meditation, checking meditation. And as a result of that, you develop the bliss of um, bliss and pliancy. So that's the meaning of special insight. And in order to have special insight, you have to have calm abiding first. So it's, it's necessary to develop calm abiding. And then on the basis of that, you develop special insight. And what we want to do in the path or what we have to do in the path is have special insight into emptiness. So emptiness, the term emptiness, we have to be a little careful because it can mean different things. It doesn't always have the same meaning. But um, there's different schools of Buddhist philosophy, one of which is called Madhyamaka Prasangika. And that's the one favored by most Tibetan teachers. And in that school of philosophy, emptiness, when they use the word emptiness, it means emptiness of inherent existence, emptiness of inherent existence. Um, I'll talk a little more about that later. Um, but this emptiness of inherent existence, this is the actual way that everything exists. Everything has emptiness as, its, as a quality, and it's actually the ultimate truth, the absolute truth, the actual way everything exists. So it's a quality of our body, of our mind, of other people, of all the things in the world around us. Everything has emptiness as its true way of existing, its true nature. However, ordinary beings, meaning those who haven't yet realized emptiness, ordinary beings um, don't see emptiness. We don't realize emptiness. We are as if blind, to emptiness, unaware of it. Um, and it's important to realize emptiness because if we don't realize emptiness, that means we have ignorance. The main kind of ignorance is ignorance of this true nature of things, how things exist. We're unaware of it. We don't see it. We're not aware. We're, yeah, we're, we're ignorant of emptiness. And as long as that's the case, as long as our mind is ignorant about emptiness, the true nature of things, we remain in samsara. Because ignorance, this ignorance of the true nature of things, um, 
causes us to get caught up in afflictive emotions, attachment to people and things that we find attractive, aversion, hostility towards people and things we don't like. And then we create karma on the basis of those afflictions and this perpetuates our existence in samsara. And so we just continue staying in samsara as long as we are blind to or unaware of emptiness. So if we do want to be free of samsara and we want to attain nirvana, we want to attain enlightenment, we have to realize emptiness. We have to understand it and realize it. And so the third bullet point says the wisdom that directly realizes this emptiness is the antidote to ignorance, which is the root of samsara, the main cause of all suffering. So if we want to be free of suffering and the causes of suffering, we have to eliminate that kind of ignorance. And the only way to get rid of that ignorance is by developing the wisdom that directly realizes this emptiness. So that's the meaning of the perfection of wisdom in the Lam Rim. It's cultivating the wisdom that directly realizes emptiness. Now, before we can have a direct realization of emptiness, we need to have a conceptual or intellectual realization of emptiness. And that means we have to study it. We have to listen to teachings and read books and talk to people who understand it, ask questions in order to clarify our doubts and misunderstandings and so on. So we need to cultivate an intellectual understanding of emptiness and meditate on it. It's not enough just to have the intellectual understanding. We need to meditate on it and, um, and meditate again and again and again. <laughs> it takes time, maybe more than one lifetime. Yeah, so don't think it's going to be quick and easy to gain this wisdom. So in the book, Girme uh, Kensa Losunjampa, right at the beginning of this chapter, talked about how beneficial it is just to hear the last bullet point. Just hearing, thinking, and reading about emptiness is very beneficial. It's, we create a lot of merit, a lot of virtue, just by trying to learn about emptiness, even if we don't understand it. <laughs> Yeah, I remember when I first started hearing about emptiness, I just felt, what? What are they talking about? I don't understand this at all. But slowly I kept, you know, hearing teachings and reading and thinking and discussing. And slowly, slowly over the years, my understanding started to grow a little bit. Now I'm even at the point where I can talk about it. <laughs> so. You do have to have patience and persistence to get an understanding of emptiness. And yeah, there's this quotation from Arya Deva, one of the masters of the lineage of the teachings on emptiness, where he says, um, yeah, just even having a doubt about emptiness, about how things exist, even to think, do things exist the way I see them or not? That alone starts shaking the foundations of samsara. It's to shake up this suffering situation we are in. Okay, so we're just gonna look a little bit at emptiness. The next slide. Um, another term for emptiness is selflessness. So those two terms are used pretty much interchangeably. One of my teachers said, yeah, they're pretty much synonymous. So you do come across the term selflessness and emptiness. And um, there are two kinds of selflessness. So this is explained in the, in the, in the book. Um, there's selflessness or emptiness of persons and of phenomena. So persons means me, you, he, she, they, 
So all living beings, even Buddhas, okay, are persons. Persons. So it's kind of funny. In Buddhism, we, we only use the word person for human beings, but Buddhism uses it for all living beings. So your dog, your cat, they are persons too, and I'm sure you agree with that. <laughs> you know them very well. They definitely have a personality. <laughs> yeah. So any kind of living being is a person. So persons are empty of inherent existence. And then the second kind is phenomena. And so phenomena means anything that exists that isn't a person. So that would be like, you know, computers and cars and trees and mountains and food and clothing and houses and so forth. So everything that's not a person is, is a phenomena. And so we need to understand, eventually we need to understand emptiness, both of persons and phenomena. However, it's recommended we start with persons. They say that's easier. And we need to start with ourself, our own sense of who, uh, I, me, myself. That's, that's the place that we should start investigating emptiness. And <clears throat> so there's different ways we can meditate on emptiness. Um, what's recommended in the book, and many books recommend this, is a practice called the four-point analysis. So there's going, we're going through four steps. The first one is identifying the object of negation. So that means, like in the case of a self, a person, it's, it's the self or person that is inherently existing, that exists inherently now, the meaning of inherent existence is uh, existing without depending on anything else, all by itself, separate, autonomous. That's how things appear. So in the case of our own I, there's a sense of an I, a me, that seems to stand by itself, not depending on anything else for its existence. Now you, you might think, no, I don't think I exist that way. But deep down inside, we do have this very subtle sense of that kind of self, an I that exists independently, separate from everything else. And so the first step is to identify that, to recognize that in our own experience, although it's not easy to do. And there's a nice explanation in the book based on teachings by Lama Tsongkhapa. Um, he says, if, if you're in the dark, let's say you're in a, a room that's totally pitch black and no light at all, and you're, you don't have a flashlight and you're trying to find your way. <laughs> so you're walking through the dark and he says, you encounter a pillar. You touch a pillar with your hand. And in that moment the pillar will seem very solid as if it doesn't exist on anything else for its existence doesn't it depend on causes and conditions it doesn't depend on somebody building it it doesn't depend on the materials it's made from it doesn't depend on the mind labeling pillar just seems to stand by itself. So there's this kind of instinctive, intuitive sense of the pillar existing in that way. That could be a, a cool experiment you could try, you know, turn off all the lights and then walk through the room and then touch something. It doesn't have to be a pillar. It could be the wall, light switch, the table, whatever. And just, just check how it seems to appear. And then it goes on to say that our sense of a self, this inherently existing self or I is similar to that, that there's a sense of a self existing in that kind of way, um, all by itself, independent of anything else, any other causes and conditions, parts, mental labeling, and so on. So this is not easy to do. And in fact, they say 
yogis go, you know, who are in retreat trying to understand emptiness, they might spend a year just trying to identify this first point, this um, sense of inherently existing self. Because when we try to look for it, it sneaks away, it disappears. They say it comes out most obviously when we get emotional, like when we get angry, upset, or excited, or if we are falsely accused or blamed for something, there's a strong sense of an I. I didn't do that. Why are you accusing me? You know. <laughs> so in those kinds of experiences, the sense of I is very clear, very vivid. Um, or any other kind of strong emotion that we might feel. There's a feeling of an I, a real I, behind that emotion, beneath that emotion, feeling that emotion. So if at those moments, if we could might be mindful and look for that I, what is that I? That's a good way to identify the object of negation. So even though it doesn't exist, in fact, according to Buddhism, an inherently existing I doesn't exist. It's like false. But it seems to exist. It seems to be there. Why? Because we've had ignorance in our mind from beginningless time. It's always been part of our mind from beginningless time. It's innate, instinctive. We didn't have to learn it from anybody. So it's something really deep and intrinsic in our mind. So right from the beginning of our life, we had this sense of an inherently existing I. So when we're a tiny baby and we're hungry, ah, I want food. <laughs> It's already there. And the newborn baby, I'm hungry. I want food. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's the explanation. It's, it's an intrinsic, innate part of our mind, part of our experience. Okay, that's the first point. Then the second point is ascertaining the entailment. What does that mean? What that means is, we're now going to start looking for this inherently existing I. And there's only two possibilities for where we could look for it, where it could exist. One is uh, within our aggregates, the same as or one with our aggregates, that means our body and mind. So it, it's somewhere within us, our body and mind, or outside, somewhere else other than our body and mind. So that terminology they use here is if that self exists it must be either the same as the aggregates or different from them so we need to contemplate that then become convinced that those are the only two choices the only two possibilities it's a bit like if you're looking for your neighbor let's say you have a neighbor named bob and you need to talk to Bob about something. And so you go over and you knock on the door and ring the doorbell and call out his name because you know you, you think you might find him in his house, he might be home. So if he's not home, if he's not there, then he's somewhere else. <laughs> he's not at home. He could be at work, he could be at the hardware store, taking a drive, whatever. He's somewhere else other than in his home. So it's a little bit like that, yeah. We're looking for the I, the inherently existing I, and there's just two possibilities. Either it's somewhere within our body and mind, like at home, or it's out there somewhere else. So then the third and fourth points are checking those two possibilities. So number three is the, you know, checking if the self is the same as the aggregates, meaning one with the aggregates, findable within the aggregates. And this is a little tricky. Um, be, yeah, because what we're looking for is an inherently existing I, meaning an independently existing I, an I that uh, exists all on its own, totally separate, totally independent, autonomous of everything else. And if that kind of self did exist, and if it was 
the same as or one with the aggregates, then um, the self and the aggregates would have to be absolutely one, not different in any way. It took me a long time to figure out why that was the case. But what I came to was, you know, if the, the inherently existing eye means an independently existing eye standing by itself, that means it doesn't depend on anything else. And if that kind of eye were to exist as one with the aggregates or the same as the aggregates, then they have to be absolutely one. There can't be any difference at all between them because if there was a difference, if the eye was even slightly different than the aggregates, that would have to be accounted for somehow. You would have to say, why is the eye different from the aggregates? There's something that makes it different from the aggregates. And that means it would be dependent. It would have to depend on something that makes it even slightly different from the aggregates. And then it couldn't be inherently existing. It wouldn't be an inherently existing or independently existing eye. I don't know if that makes sense to you, but that's what I came to in my thinking. And that's why, if, you know, if the I is really inherently existing, independently existing, and it's one with the aggregates, they have to be absolutely exactly the same in every way. So if this was the case, then there would be a couple of possible consequences, absurd consequences. So one is, since we have five aggregates, Buddhism says we can divide up our self into five aggregates, body, feelings, discriminations, compositional factors, and consciousness. So there's five aggregates. So if the I, an independently existing I, was one with the aggregates, then we'd have to have five eyes. There would have to be five eyes, just as there's five aggregates. There would have to be five eyes. That takes time to think about, to make sense. But Lama Zopi Rinpoche kind of jokes about that. And he said, so that if that was the case, then when you travel, you would have to buy five tickets. <laughs> you have five eyes, so you'd have to buy five tickets five seats on the plane or train or whatever. And you'd probably have to have five passports as well. <laughs> so you're, you're five eyes. <laughs> That's funny. So obviously that isn't the case. We only have one passport and we only have to buy one ticket on the plane. So we would say, no, 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 no. I'm not five eyes. I'm only one eye. So then the consequence is, okay, if I'm just one person, one I, then I should have only one aggregate. I should have, the, you know, my, that would just be one whole monolithic uh, thing <laughs> rather than, you know, something that can be divided up into five different parts or many different parts. Because if we think about all the different parts of our body, all the different bones and so on, we actually have many different parts of us. But we couldn't have many different parts if we were just one eye, and the eye was one with the aggregates. Now, I'm just going through this quickly, but it's actually not, not easy. So you do need to kind of read and study and think and, and so on. But there are absurd consequences if we think that the self is the same as the aggregates. So. The second possibility, number four, is checking if the self is different from the aggregates. And this is actually easy <laughs> because if we have an inherently existing self or I or me, and we don't find it within the aggregates, it's not the same as the aggregates. And the only other option is that it's out there somewhere, separate from the aggregates. Now, if that was the case, we could have our aggregates in one place <clears throat> and our self could be somewhere else. So our aggregates, like my body and mind could be sitting here on this chair, but my self could go into the kitchen and get a cup of tea. My eye could go somewhere else and do something else or go and talk to somebody. 
So our self could be completely separate from the aggregates because again, it's an inherently existing or independently existing I. So it doesn't depend on the aggregates. It doesn't depend on anything. So it can be completely independent of the aggregates and just go off and do whatever it wants, leave the aggregates behind. Obviously that isn't the case, even though we might like to do it sometimes, <laughs> but it doesn't happen like that. <laughs> Um, so this is just a very brief overview of these, of the full point analysis, but really to understand it, uh, we need to study, read, think about it, ask questions. It took me years, years really to understand these four points. And then what we need to do is meditate on it. And they say, if you do meditate on these on these four points you do it well you do it properly what will happen is you will end up realizing that that inherently existing self doesn't exist it disappears it vanishes you realize it's it's a complete fabrication of the mind and so you'll have an experience of emptiness emptiness of the inherently existing i and then you need to meditate on it focus on it so the book says um, apply concentration concentrate on that experience of emptiness with without sinking or excitement and this experience this meditation is called space like equipoise because it has two aspects two factors one is that um, your mind has certainty about the lack of inherent existence of the self. And what appears is a space-like vacuity, space-like emptiness. And then outside of meditation, once you finish your meditation and you're going out and looking at other things, you practice what's called um, illusion-like appearance, meaning that the things you see you, you know that although they appear inherently existing, they appear to be inherently independently existing, but you know that's not the case. So a good analogy for this is a mirage. You've been in the desert and you look on the horizon in the middle of the day, the sun is shining on the desert. You can see what appears to be a body of water. It really looks like there's a lake or a river over there. But if you go and investigate, you'll find no water, it's just sand. So it's just an appearance, but you can recognize that although it appears like water, it's not water, it's just a, like an illusion. So a yogi, a meditator who has a realization of emptiness will have that kind of experience with everything they see. So things appear real, inherently existing, but they know they're not like that. So that's just a very brief explanation of one way to meditate on emptiness, especially with regard to the self. But we also, the next slide, um, we can apply it to other phenomena like our body. So, um, Briefly, <laughs> the first point is to identify the object of negation, meaning a body, like using our own body, that seems to exist inherently, truly, independently from its own side. So we try to catch a glimpse of that. And then we go through the same process. If that kind of body does exist, there's only two possibilities. One is that it's the same as or one with its parts or different, separate from them. And then you investigate those two possibilities. So the book explains how to do that. And in Chandrakirti, uh, one other method for meditating on emptiness is called um, Chandrakirti's seven point. It's basically the same as the four point analysis, but it kind of goes into other possibilities. Um, and uh, he starts with a car, no, he, sorry, a chariot. <laughs> he, 
he uses the example of a chariot, but we can use a car. So if you go to the next slide, um, I have a picture of a nice new shiny car. So when we see a really nice new car like this, we probably we probably think it appears truly existing. There's a truly existing, inherently existing car there. Um, and we, we might have attachment to it. We'd like to have a car like that. So that's getting some sense of a truly existing or inherently existing car. But then the next slide, if, we, if such a car does exist, now this isn't exactly the same kind of car. I couldn't find a, a Mercedes that had been taken apart. But anyway, <laughs> we get the idea. So a car is composed of so many different parts. And you could even take it apart even more than that. You could take the doors off and so on. And um, there's probably thousands of different parts if you consider all the little screws and so on. So you can do this mentally. You can mentally take the car apart and then see if you can find a car among all these parts. Is there any of these parts you can point to and say, that's the car? And so if you do that, yeah, you'll probably get some little glimpse of the meaning of emptiness. Emptiness means there is no inherently, truly, objectively existing car. There's just a whole bunch of parts that have been put together in a certain way and is able to function as a car, provided it has been put together the right way. We can get in and go for a drive, go shopping, whatever. So it does work, it does function as a car, but then when we try to find a car, it disappears. So I think this is actually a very helpful way to get some sense of emptiness using an, an external object like that, like a car. And then Chandrakirti says, you apply it to yourself, to your eye. You don't have time to go into that. Um, but there's some really good books on, on emptiness. Um, one of my favorites is called Insight into Emptiness by Kensar Jampa Tekchok. One of my teachers, he gave a series of teachings at Land of Medicine Buddha um, for, I don't know how long, a year or two. And those were read into a book. That's a pretty good, very good book. Another one, I haven't read it, but people say it's very good. Guy Newland wrote a book called Introduction to Emptiness. So he's someone with you know, quite, a, quite good knowledge of emptiness. So there's many books out there on emptiness and different opportunities to learn about emptiness. So um, the last slide is just a conclusion. <laughs> we didn't have time to go into this in much depth, but I do want to emphasize that it is important to understand emptiness. It is difficult, it's not easy, but essential. If you really want to get somewhere in the spiritual path, you want to get to enlightenment, you want to get to nirvana, you want to get to higher realizations, it is important to understand emptiness. It is challenging. So some things you can do are listen to teachings, make sure they're reliable teachings, um, reliable teachers teaching, people who have studied and have a good understanding. And also read, study, clarify your doubts, talk to people um, to get your questions answered and meditate <clears throat> on what you understand. And then you'll probably get more questions then you can go back to your teachers, back to your books, and try to clarify those. So it's a process, an ongoing process. And they also say, point number three, it is important to do other practices as well, to do purification practice. Most of us in this tradition do a daily, at least one <clears throat> daily practice of purification. You can do more than one, like one in the morning, one at night. Purification is important because if our mind is clogged up with a lot of negative energy, uh, negative 
emotions and bad karma from the past and so on that that makes it harder to have a clear mind to be able to understand emptiness so it is important to do regular purification practice clear up that bad energy and also build up positive energy or merit so do virtuous actions as well like making offerings um, living ethically of course um, yeah, so anything that's virtuous, constructive, beneficial, do that to build up positive energy. So those two things are also like complementary practices to our study of emptiness. And finally, we do need patience and joyous effort. So accept that it may take time and may be difficult so just keep working at it remember how beneficial it is it's so beneficial it's so meritorious just trying to understand emptiness so try not to get discouraged have joyous effort so i didn't have time to go into all the details of the book the easy path i thought it would be easy <laughs> It's not a very big book, but there's a lot of material in there. And um, I, so it's been just the kind of introduction to the book. And I, I hope you will continue reading it and studying it and learning more about it. And um, also, I had the intention to talk more about the, the topic of relying on a spiritual teacher. I was planning to do that at the end after we finished the book because it makes more sense once you learn about the path to enlightenment, then it makes more sense how important it is to have a spiritual teacher and rely on a spiritual teacher. But I ran out of time to do that. Um, but I noticed that Nick Rebush gave a teaching or course on uh, the spiritual teacher for Tupta Norba Ling. So those um, videos would be on the YouTube channel. You can go back and watch those. There's a lot of books on the topic of spiritual teachers. So there will be other opportunities for you to learn that topic. So I have enjoyed this course. I hope you have as well. And even though we didn't have as much time as it would have been nice to have to do the course, the topic justice. But anyway, Hopefully it's been at least inspiring for you to learn more, study more, go further. We have a few minutes left if anyone has a question you would like to ask. Matt. Hi. Yes, you can ask your question. <laughs> oh. Yes, thank you, Vulnerable. You, I may have misheard you, but you mentioned that um, most people find it easier to realize or work with emptiness in regards to persons rather than objects. Did I mishear you? No, this is what the teachers say. This is what the tradition says. And um, I have difficulty with that. And I think other people do as well, because it seems, for example, a car. <laughs> It seems like easier to understand the emptiness of a car than uh, the person. However, when they say it's easier to understand uh, the emptiness of a person than, a, than phenomena, they're actually referring to our aggregates, um, our own body and mind. They say that um, that's more, it's more difficult to understand the emptiness of our aggregates, our body and mind, than it is to understand the emptiness of the eye. So um, that's mainly what they're talking about. I still am not 100% convinced because my sense of self or I seems pretty concrete. <laughs> Easier to understand the body is empty than the eye, but th that's what they say. So I'm just passing on what the teachers say, but there may be, maybe there's no pervasion. Maybe for some people, then it could be easier to understand emptiness of our aggregates than of the I. But eventually, sooner or later, we do have to understand the emptiness of everything. We can't, you know, just understand the emptiness of one thing and leave all the rest. 
Okay, and then a quick follow-up question to that. Um, when dealing with latencies or latent mind states after you've realized uh, uh, emptiness on some level or done some purification around that, how, uh, you know, I'm probably opening up a, a wide thing, but how does one just kind of accept or treat the latencies that are, that are probably going to arise, I'm assuming, even though you've realized emptiness on some level? You mean latencies of emotions like anger, attachment, and so on? Exactly. Yeah. Like yeah. The, I mean, it, the, direct, the direct realization of emptiness is the antidote to those. That's, that's what will eliminate all those latencies. But okay. it does take time to do that. It doesn't happen all at once. And also, when we initially understand emptiness, our understanding will be a conceptual realization, a conceptual understanding. And then we need to continue meditating on that with calm abiding and eventually attain a special insight uh, into emptiness. And that's still not a direct realization. We still have to go further and um, attain the direct realization of emptiness. So there's kind of a, a process to have that direct realization of emptiness, but that is the thing that will eliminate our afflictive emotions, anger, attachment, and so forth, and their latencies. So there's kind of a, a number of stages to go through. So yeah, in the meantime, even after a initial realization or understanding of emptiness, we'll still have these afflictive emotions coming up but they won't be as strong. They won't be as strong as before because of our understanding of emptiness. And then gradually they'll get weaker and weaker and eventually they'll be erased <laughs> altogether. So it's a process. That's a good Okay, question. thank you, Venerable. Thank you. So we should probably end now and we'll do the dedication verses to dedicate the merit, the positive energy. And also, yeah, I am teaching on Wednesday mornings, a course on emptiness. So if you want to know more about emptiness, there'll be more opportunities uh, for a few more Wednesday mornings. Venerable, if it's okay, we'd like to just briefly offer a Thanksgiving mandala. Oh, sure. Short one. Thank you so much, Venerable. Saji pu ki ju shing me tog tram ri rab li ji ni de gen pa di sange jing du li Tehuahe <coughs> 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 Okay, so we've created a lot of merit, a lot of positive energy by listening to these teachings with a good motivation, wanting to benefit all living beings. So let's now share the merit, the positive energy with all living beings for their freedom from suffering and attainment of full enlightenment. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, May I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. And for the long lives of our precious spiritual teachers, <coughs> incomparably kind and supreme Tenzin Gyatso, 
the wish fulfilling, wish granting jewel, source of every benefit and happiness in this world. May you have a long life and all your holy wishes be spontaneously fulfilled. You who uphold the subduer's moral way, who serve as the bountiful bearer of all, sustaining, preserving, and spreading Manjunath's victorious doctrine, who masterfully accomplish magnificent prayers, honoring the three sublime ones, savior of myself and others, your disciples, please, please live long. <coughs> So thanks to Venerable Dundra and Mary and all the people at Tobin Ling for making this course possible. Thank you so much, Venerables. Thank you so much. <laughs>